Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Mühlebach. Um, Michael leads the independent research group uh, Learning and Dynamical Systems at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen in Germany. Um, he was trained at ETH Zurich, which is also where we met. And um, one, one thing to say about him is he won virtually every award of all stages of his education. So he studied mechanical engineering at ETH Zurich, specialized in robotics, dynamical systems and control. He received the outstanding bachelor award from the department and a prize for the best master's degree. And then going on with a PhD, he worked with Professor Rafaela D'Andrea, for which she then won the ETH medal and the Hilti Prize for his doctoral thesis. The Hilti Prize in, ge in general, I think is very valuable. It honors the uh, practical relevance of a PhD, if I'm not mistaken. And then he joined the group of uh, Michael Jordan at Berkeley as a postdoc to work more on computer science uh, side of research. Yeah, Michael researched a lot of interesting topics. Uh, to mention just one line of work that I particularly enjoyed, uh, Michael presented an interpretation of Nesterov acceleration that is based on dynamical systems, which I think is very interesting. All right, with that, Michael, you can take it away. Oh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, in the next 45 uh, to 60 minutes, I'll give you an overview of some of the uh, research that has been happening um, essentially uh, in my group, but also uh, during my postdoc and uh, yeah, during my postdoc at Berkeley. So as you know, machine learning drives science, engineering and technology. And we've witnessed a lot of uh, progress in, in the last years, but mainly machine learning has been used um, as essentially a, a tool for pattern recognition and where um, essentially we have concentrated on applications uh, that that uh, arise in the virtual uh, domain. So me and my group were interested in bringing machine learning to large scale cyber physical systems. So these are systems that are um, intimately connected uh, with the real world. And uh, here's three uh, potential applications. So in uh, supply chains, we could use machine learning to predict demand and also anticipate supply shortages. And as a result, we could economize cost and also um, reduce the probability of disruption. In uh, the smart grid, we can use machine learning to balance different energy producers and energy uh, consumers. Um, and this could lead to, for example, a better use of alternative energy sources. And in industrial processes, we could use machine learning um, to reduce the size of our assembly lines and to make these robots here more adaptive so that we can quickly uh, adapt to changing consumer needs. But if you think of applying machine learning in these uh, situations for these large scale systems, you realize um, that it's a non-trivial and daunting task. Um, why? Because these systems typically evolve over time. There's multiple agents and sometimes they have competing, sometimes uh, collaborating interests. There's feedback loops, et cetera, right? And so guaranteeing that our predictions are safe and reliable is, is actually a major challenge. Another challenge is that um, today's algorithm usually require um, some internet scale data, um, but in these situations, collecting data might be very expensive and uh, time consuming. So we have to find algorithms that are sample efficient. And the last challenge I would like to mention is um, because we have uh, non-stationarity, because we have dynamics that evolve over time, we'd like to apply online learning. So we'd like to retrain or re-update our models in, in real time. Um, but that can be only done if, if our algorithms are, for example, uh, insensitive to hyperparameter tuning, right? We cannot have uh, a data scientist that constantly observes and retunes our machine learning models, right? We deploy in real life. Um, and so as a result, um, and okay, and behind these challenges, um, I think there's a fundamental gap between disciplines. So uh, there's the disciplines of control, machine learning, and robotics, and each of these disciplines uh, provide very valuable tools, right? Controls provides dynamics and safety aspects, machine learning provides the statistical and computational tools, and robotics provides the integration and hardware aspects. And so with our research, we try to fill this gap. And uh, essentially, I will show you some, some examples. And so the first example I would like to make is 
of course, we can use machine learning and controls uh, for solving robotics problems, right? And here's an example. Uh, so that's a, a, a cube that I've been working during my PhD. So this cube has three reaction wheels, uh, which are mounted orthogonally and attached to each reaction wheel, there's a mechanical braking system. And we can uh, pull this brake to make the cube jump up and then uh, balance on the edge or, or on the corner. And uh, the corresponding learning problem here is how do we find the initial wheel speeds so that after pulling the brakes, we arrive in upright uh, position. And so we used uh, a quasi-Newton method um, that was also able to account for some of the prior knowledge we had about the physics of the system. So um, this led to a very sample efficient uh, learning scheme. So we required about three to four trials for learning the right initial wheel speeds. Um, but what I would like to highlight next, and that's something that um, Marcel already alluded to, is the, the fact that we can also use ideas from control theory and from dynamics to better understand uh, machine learning algorithms. So that's going to be the first part of my talk. And I'm going to um, um, show you how we can interpret um, accelerated optimization algorithms as um, dynamical systems. And uh, well, essentially these gradient-based and accelerated algorithms are essentially the workhorse of machine learning. So that's, that's how this connects to machine learning. And we're not going to stop there. So uh, of course we can use these uh, tools from dynamical systems to, to explain essentially already existing algorithms, for example, Nestor of accelerated gradient methods, but I will also show you how we can use these ideas and, and go even a step further and design new algorithms uh, in the context of, of constraint optimization. And then I will try to relate this to the challenges that I mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, so let's get started. Let's quickly um, talk about acceleration. Um, and so that's gonna be relatively brief. Um, and you have to, because the, the work is also uh, quite a while back, so you have to uh, then maybe um, interrupt me if you have questions or if you'd like to know more about it, or we can also discuss uh, later on. Okay, so what's acceleration? Well, you can see on the bottom some empirical results that compare an, a, an accelerated method, here Nesterov's uh, accelerated gradient method with a constant step size, um, and, and it compares it to the gradient method, plain gradient methods, uh, also with a constant step size, and as you can see on this test problem, you easily obtain uh, an order of magnitude improvement. Um, and the important thing is that both methods have about the same complexity per iteration. So this is um, a, a huge improvement and uh, applied in a machine learning scenario, it might make the difference whether you have to wait for your training to complete for a week or whether you can do it in a day. Right? And um, there's the equations, the update equations here um, that describe this accelerated method that I used to generate the plots. And um, you see that it's relatively complicated. So it has this uh, position Q, it has this momentum state P, and it has these uh, damping parameters T and beta, and uh, T is the uh, time step. And so what I was able to do in my research was to relate this um, to some continuous time dynamical system. So it turns out that if you take these continuous time dynamics and you discretize them with this semi-implicit Euler scheme, you obtain exactly the discrete uh, time equations. And uh, why is this interesting? Well, because it gives you a qualitative, or you have to, uh, is, there, is there a question? Um, no, okay. I think you can continue. Okay, should question. I continue? Okay, and so why is this interesting? Well, it gives you um, a, a qualitative, first of all, it gives you a qualitative understanding of via this continuous time model of how, of how um, these dynamics evolve. And you can answer questions about uh, stability and attractivity of, of different local minima. But also because there's this explicit relation between continuous time and discrete time by the semi-implicit Euler scheme, it allows you to actually get quantitative results for the discrete time algorithm. So that's something that I explored. And What's interesting about this discretization scheme is that you can divide it into two parts. So um, this discretization, the semi-implicit Euler scheme, you can divide it uh, first into a step that updates the momentum uh, coordinate P with the non-potential forces 
So you can think of this as a as an energy dissipation step, right? That's that's what's shown here. And then um, uh, after that, you update um, your momentum and position with um, um, the conservative part of the dynamics. And here you use um, a symplectic the symplectic Euler scheme, uh, which is very well known. And it's in, in symplectic, so it means that uh, you preserve some of the underlying Hamiltonian properties of the conservative part of the dynamics. So you can you can think of this as an energy conserving step, and this one as an energy dissipating uh, step. And so you alternate between the two. And uh, this was essentially the key insight um, that I used to come up with um, uh, quantitative characterizations of, of conversions rates. Um, and the special thing about these results is that they apply to a non-convex setting. Right? The, the standard analysis of using estimate sequence or, or Lyapunov functions, that's usually um, um, constrained to a convex setting. But here, I mean, you can use this modified, you can generate a modified uh, energy function uh, via the symplectic updates. And you can use this modified energy function as, as a Lyapunov function as well. But it gives you the structure of the update gives you kind of a principled way of constructing this modified energy function. Okay, and so here's the result I would like to highlight. So if we have um, X star, a local minimum with a certain region of attraction and a certain condition number, then for example, you can uh, get results on how you should choose your damping parameters. And it turns out that as long as the damping parameters D and beta scale with one over a square root of the condition number, then um, there's a time step T so that you can get um, a convergence rate, a linear convergence rate of uh, the discrete time equations where the rate scales with the square root of, uh, of kappa, right? And let me emphasize this, that this is, um, of course, much faster than gradient descent where the rate scales with one over uh, kappa, right? Um, and I see that there's a, there's a, a raised hand. Yep, I don't even have to do it, Hassan. <laughs> so right. maybe you can uh, just speak up, yeah. Yes, hi, Michael. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, it, sounds, it looks like over here that this is a local convergence result, right? Um, well, it's a kind of semi-global, I would say. So um, yeah, you say, okay, you have a region of attraction and then for any compact set A in this region of attraction, you have, you have this rate, right? Um, so you'd have to look into the paper uh, exactly. But what I can say is that essentially I divided the stability analysis and, and the rate analysis. And you can think of the rate analysis as local, but uh, the stability analysis, which is uh, a key aspect, is, is not local. Yeah. Um, OK. That's uh, your, your question. Yeah. Uh, to, to some extent. The, the, the other related question, I guess, is is there any uh, notion of how many iterations it would you would need to uh, enter this local region of attraction? Or is that completely? Uh, unknown, depending on the structure of F. Um, no, so in principle, so in principle, you can you can come up with bounds, right? So if you if you give me um, an objective function, in principle, I can construct um, my backwards error analysis. Um, again, it's the details you have to read up about the details, but it, you can in principle construct an explicit perturbed uh, Hamiltonian, um, and with this perturbed Hamiltonian, you can. Uh, characterize um, essentially the region of attraction, um, and you can come up with an explicit um, um, constant t here, independent of kappa, and an explicit rate. Um, okay. But it's correct that some of the constants I do not explicitly characterize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. So, so you're you're right. You're right. So there's, in, in a sense, what I do is, is um, um, I, I characterize convergence rates up to, up to kind of a, an additive and multiplicative constant independent of kappa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let me know if you have further questions and just, just uh, speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And. Um, Okay, so that was the, the summary of this acceleration part. Uh, but now I would like to highlight some, some of the newer results uh, on constraint optimization. Um, and essentially, if you think about uh, constraint optimization, 
Um, so um, a standard way is to, to think about uh, constraints, which are uh, a very clear structure. So by, by the structure, this could be a low dimensional hyperplane or a norm ball or uh, the probability simplex or something on which you can um, project easily. Right? And then um, there's, for example, Frank Wolf or projected gradients, which lead to very efficient uh, algorithms. Now, if you have a feasible set that don't have this uh, simple, simple structure, then um, it's, it's a bit unclear how you, how you proceed. Um, and, and then people usually use sequential quadratic programming or interior point methods, um, but these are second order. So this means that if you have very high dimensional problems, you have to invert um, a KKT matrix or so, and this can be uh, also quite, quite challenging. And so I was wondering if there's actually something here. So uh, essentially first order methods that can deal with uh, unstructured uh, constraints. And what I um, uh, essentially did was to exploit analogies uh, between optimization and non-smooth mechanics, right? So here V is the objective function and G is the, the um, constraints, right? And you can construct a corresponding non-smooth mechanical system so that the equilibria of the system correspond to the stationary point of, of the optimization problem, right? And um, if, um, um, so th this is a kind of an animation that illustrates the point. So we can then simulate this uh, non-smooth mechanical system, which is here represented as this uh, blue point. It, uh, it rolls downhill, impacts the boundary of the feasible set, and, and it ultimately uh, rests at, a, at an equilibrium. And by construction, we know that this equilibrium corresponds to a stationary point of, of the optimization problem. And here, because this example is uh, convex, the, the equilibrium corresponds even to the global uh, minimum. Right? And let's now think a bit more closely about what's, what this actually means. So if we uh, contrast this to, to the standard approach in optimization, there um, usually constraints are thought of as a, as a position level constraints. Right. So, for example, in projected gradients, you make a step along the negative gradients and then you project onto the feasible set. And if the feasible set is nonlinear or non-convex, evaluating this projection can be very difficult. And now, what does this uh, mechanical systems perspective bring to the table? Well, essentially, you model the interaction between your, uh, your algorithm, x of t, right, the solution of your algorithm, and the feasible set via this constraint force. So the constraint force models the interaction between feasible set and the algorithm. And you can use that to lift, for example, um, position constraints to a velocity level. So instead of saying that the solution must be contained in, in the feasible set C at all times, you can say that uh, the forward velocity should be contained in the tangent cone, right? And um, uh, here's an, an example of how this, how this looked like. So the tangent cone is represented by this um, um, red half space, so that's all the points here, and then the corresponding normal cone, uh, which is where this constraint force lies in, um, is, is represented by this uh, blue ray, um, and then we have uh, a possible solution candidate x dot, which is in the tangent cone. And here's some more examples, so if we're at x1, then the tangent cone is spanned by these two uh, rays, if we're at x2, then it's again a half space. Right? But in any case, um, even though the underlying set C is uh, non-convex, we see that this approximation or, or this velocity constraint leads to, to a local linear convex approximation of the feasible set. Right. And um, the only problem is that in continuous time, imposing that the forward velocity should be in the tangent cone for all times is actually equivalent to saying that your solution uh, trajectory should remain feasible. Right. But if you then discretize, if you discretize, you make steps of finite lengths. And um, so you can easily become unfe infeasible, right? So for example, here, um, of course, x, so we can encode that the forward velocity xk plus one minus xk divided by t, t is again a time step, should be encoded in this, uh, should be contained in the tangent code, but then you make a step uh, of finite lengths. And of course you might, you might be infeasible. So there's, there's um, some sort of mechanism that we have to introduce uh, to account this. And the way we went about this was to extend, extend the notion of tangent cone 
uh, by introducing this set um, v alpha. So you can still think of this as a as a velocity constraint. But what you do what you do here is you add um, um, this restitution coefficient, right? So this ensures that the forward velocity uh, points slightly towards a feasible set if you're if you're infeasible. But what's very important in this formulation here is that we only consider the constraints which are um, currently violated. So if we're at a certain x, x of t, uh, then we only consider constraints which are violated at this position, right? So we don't anticipate any constraint violations um, or something along these lines. So it's really, so the set V alpha is really a sparse local approximation of, of the underlying feasible set. And we then, um, we're, we're thinking about whether we can actually come up with convergence uh, guarantees and convergence rates um, for, for these sort of algorithms. And so here's uh, probably the simplest way in which you could formulate an algorithm that uses uh, this velocity constraint. So it's a gradient-based algorithm where you project onto this uh, local sparse approximations at every, at every iteration. And uh, we have both uh, results, convergence results for the convex setting as well as for the non-convex setting. In the convex setting, the interesting thing is you can make it work even for a constant step size. And uh, the bound on the step size is given here. So it's essentially a, a natural generalization from, from the um, unconstrained setting, where in the unconstrained setting, you have the Lipschitz constant of the objective that dictates uh, the maximum step size. But in the constrained setting, you have here the Lipschitz constant of the Lagrangian, right? And um, in a non-convex setting, you need a, a sequence of uh, diminishing step sizes um, to, to make it work. But you might now wonder uh, how this works in practice. So here's some uh, benchmark results. So we apply this to dense quadratic programs or also dense trust region problems. And uh, we compare this to CVXOPT. So that's an interior point method. Um, and the interesting thing is on these dense quadratic programs, uh, empirically CVXOPT scales with n cubed, uh, which is typically what you would expect. And uh, our, our method here scales roughly with n squared. So that's, that's quite an improvement. Um, so I was very excited uh, to see this. And um, on dense trust region problems, you also have uh, quite significant uh, speed ups. And I think the main reason for these speed ups is that essentially you consider only uh, constraints which are violated, right? You only have this uh, local um, approximation. So at every iteration, you, you usually only consider about five to 10% of, of all potential constraints. Um, and, and this leads to, to this improvement. And uh, now I would like to, or let me know if there's questions. Um, just, just raise your hand and, and speak up. And yeah. Because if not, uh, I would like to, to go on and uh, show you some, some of the kind of connections. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, so what, what is yeah. the, uh, the, the, there are lots of um, linear methods where you uh, you form a sign distance function out of the uh, constraints and then uh, use your, your favorite um, acceleration, yeah. which, also, yeah. like, which also show, uh, you know, quadratic uh, scaling in terms of solution time. What, what are your um, convergence criteria? Is this to a certain number of digits of precision? Uh, I would have to check. So I think it's a condition on the gradient. So you said the termination criteria in the sense of uh, the gradient. So, I mean, uh, the corresponding generalization for constraints, but essentially saying type of gradient should be below a certain threshold, right? So that's the termination criteria. I see. So, so um... I mean, did, did you take a look, for example, at that uh, duality cap criteria? Um, they tend to. Yeah, yeah. I didn't explicitly look at um, duality gap, uh, but I also monitor uh, feasibility. So convergence to the feasible set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. And indeed, uh, so maybe to, to, to go back here, um, essentially, what you do here is you impose a linear. Uh, decay of uh, the, the violated constraints, right? And this constant alpha is roughly uh, the, the rate at which these uh, 
constraint violations are expected to to decay. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that gives you in a way a handle, a direct handle of of uh, how how quickly you converge the feasible set. Yeah. Okay. And and of course, quadratic uh, programs are ex ex generally extremely well behaved. Uh, I yeah. wonder. Um, when we when we go to actual machine learning problems, which are typically mm -hmm. messier, do mm -hmm. we, do we have enough information to actually pick reasonable values for all for these constants in these in these uh, theorems? Yeah, that's a question. I mean, um, I mean that's a, that's a valid question. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so in my experience, picking the constants are is kind of fine and of course you can always um, revert to so, so, some sort of uh, diminishing step size um, uh, routine right and then and then there's no constant uh, needed at all right mm -hmm. um, so yeah in, in my experience it's in a way two different it's unfortunately it's in a way two different worlds <laughs> which is one is the 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 sort of uh, theoretical uh, world that that you know tries to get explicit rates and so on, um, where of course you have these constants you you need to know the Lipschitz constant and so on, and then there's the more empirical world where where um, of course you care just about the empirical performance, um, and and the two are not necessarily entirely aligned. Of course, there's a lot of insights that you can take from from a a, a concrete analysis. Um, but but then there's also limits, right? And so choosing finding these hyperparameters that's that's certainly one one of these uh, uh, problems where the two two worlds are a bit disconnected. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Still, the results are nice. Yeah, it gives us courage. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, one one thing which I uh, should highlight here is that really these. The, the algorithm as such is, is highly non-trivial, so I don't uh, spend too much time now explaining the dynamics of this, but because you don't anticipate constraints, um, you have really a non-smooth update uh, here. So this update function here, um, that depends, of course, on the, the violated constraints. Um, and, and of course, the, the set of violated constraints it, it, it leads to this sort of combinatorial flavor because different constraints can be violated at different times. Uh, and so establishing convergence guarantees um, uh, was not a, a trivial uh, task. Yeah. I saw, I saw another, another question. Um, or should I just uh, continue? Maybe the question was answered with your answer to Matt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. So, so let me point out to um, maybe let, let me make this connection to to some of the challenges uh, that I mentioned, right? So this uh, points out to to some some of the uh, more ongoing work. So here we also extended this to to momentum based methods. So the, the result I showed earlier was uh, on, on gradient descent. And here we also applied uh, gradient descent with momentum. And what's interesting about this um, uh, local approximation of the feasible set is that even if your feasible set is non-convex, your local approximation is still convex. And so if you have, for example, these uh, sparse regression problems, um, then the, the, the state of the art or prior work usually uses uh, L1 regularization. Right, where p is equal to one, and then you can, for example, uh, do projected gradients, and the projections can be evaluated uh, in closed form. But if p is uh, less than one, then then these sort of projection-based approaches, it's unclear how to how to generalize. And uh, with with the approach I just showed you, because you're relying on on the uh, essentially the local uh, behavior, local approximations of a feasible set, you can still compute updates uh, in closed form, even if uh, p, is, p, is, p is less than one. And so you obtain very efficient, uh, or at least uh, efficient algorithms, which the per iteration complexity um, scales with, with n, the problem size, and you can apply this to image reconstruction tasks. So for example, uh, here we try this on, on reconstructing this blurred image. And if you have p less than one, then you would can encode a little bit of additional sparsity, and you get you get a visually uh, better reconstruction. So that's one thing uh, I would like to highlight. Um, 
And uh, then there's also ongoing work uh, with another group leader from uh, uh, Katrina de Baco. Um, and she's interested in solving um, essentially um, of, uh, solving flow problems over uh, transportation networks. And what's, what's cool now is that we can include constraints. So we can essentially uh, put a, a constraint on the capacity that a certain highway or road uh, has. And we can also uh, add the constraint on the infrastructure cost. And again, even if this infrastructure constraint is not convex, the, the per iteration or, or the, the update for one iteration can still uh, be essentially uh, done in closed form. So you obtain uh, quite efficient algorithms where at least the per iteration complexity um, scales well in number of decision variables. And we can use that to predict, for example, uh, the passenger flows in, in the bus network of uh, Grenoble. And um, here's another um, uh, project. Uh, so this is from Guan Chun, a student of mine. And he was looking at um, essentially a physics literature. And it's interesting that the, in the physics literature, there's people trying to um, uh, come up with oscillator networks. Um, and these oscillator networks are used to solve combinatorial optimization problems, or at least find uh, some sort of heuristic solutions to, to combinatorial optimization problems. And they use um, a phenomenon called uh, subharmonic injection locking. And so Wan Chun was able to uh, relate this to the penalty methods in optimization. So it turns out that this uh, subharmonic injection locking, uh, which leads to a synchronization between, between the, the oscillators, you can interpret this simply as a, as a penalty term. And he also thought about what's a good coupling function here so that you can incentivize these oscillators to um, uh, settle down in, in phase or antiphase, which corresponds to, to a binarized uh, solution. And um, let me uh, emphasize one, one other application or one other ongoing work. Uh, that's the work from Aniket. So he looked at min-max optimization. And of course, min-max optimization, you can also formulate this as a constrained optimization problem. But the constraint is very challenging because you have to impose here uh, that this function should be less than t for all y, right? And um, min-max optimization is very useful. You can, for example, use it um, for, for uh, with uh, GANs and, and for generating some sort of realistic looking images. Um, or min-max optimization is also very useful um, if you want to robustify um, your, your machine learning classifiers, right? Because the standard problem is that you can add a little bit of perturbation um, to an image, for example, and then your classifier will tell you that it's a gibbon instead of a panda. And if you want to avoid this, then you should, you should think about min-max. And so what Anika did is he looked at stochastic gradient descent ascent algorithms, and um, he essentially thought about um, different sampling routines. So this is a finite sum setting, and you can uh, imagine different ways of sampling uh, these, these finite components. So at every iteration, you can either pick one of the components at random, or you can sample an entire permutation um, of the different uh, data points of these different component functions. Or maybe you have an adversary um, that essentially uh, gives you the worst case that manipulates the ordering in which the data points are fed to your, to your algorithm uh, in an adversarial uh, manner. And it turns out that um, the impact on the convergence rate is quite significant. So it goes from one over nk to one over nk squared if you, if you do this shuffling, but you get one over k squared. So you suffer the one over n um, if, if uh, you have an adversary that uh, specifies the ordering in which, in which the data points arrive. And um, so he was able to characterize that and it translates in empirical, in empirical results uh, it translates to, to actually quite uh, significant uh, changes, right? So here's comparisons between the uniform sampling and the sampling of a permutation, um, and we applied proximal point method and uh, uh, alternating gradient descent ascent. And in both uh, cases, the, the choice of sampling can, can impact performance quite significantly, yeah. Okay, and the last, uh, 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 in a way, uh, the last uh, question or the last point I would like to make. So I'd like to relate these constraint optimization algorithms to robotics again. And so I, here's the question for you. How, how many reaction wheels do you think are required for balancing this cube? 
So I showed you earlier that it, needs, it has three uh, reaction wheels. So three, because with each reaction wheel, you can generate a torque in one of the spatial directions. So does somebody have a guess on how many reaction wheels are required for balancing? I mean, feel free to just uh, speak up. I'm going to guess two. Two, right? Uh, why? Because you want to give up your, right? And then you have two tilt directions. But it turns out that a single reaction wheel is actually enough. Um, and the answer to that is, uh, is essentially constraint optimization. So you can design the inertia of the system in a very particular way. So you can have a lot of inertia along one tilt axis, very little inertia along the other tilt axis. Um, and, and, um, yeah, and then of course it should incorporate uh, structural constraints and, and saturation constraints on the motor. And um, yeah, and so we built essentially the world's first balancing robot <laughs> that balances on a, on a tip uh, with a single reaction wheel, right? And from a controls perspective, what happens here is that you have different inertia along the two tilt axis and it's different inertia decouples the time constants um, uh, along the two, two uh, unstable uh, directions. And this, this makes it actually controllable. And uh, of course, it's very challenging. You have one control input to in order to, to stabilize about 10 degrees of freedom and uh, most of which uh, are unstable to, to marginally uh, stable. And so these 10 degrees of freedom also include structural vibrations because you have this elongated structure. So you need to account for, for structural uh, vibrations also. So um, yeah, so I thought this would be fun to show you. And uh, so let me come back to the challenges. So um, we saw that uh, we can solve constraint optimization problems in, in, where, where we have non-convex constraints or non-linear constraints. And constraints are very important, of course, to model uh, actuation limits and uncertainty. But in machine learning, they could be also used to incorporate uh, prior knowledge. And um, this could address some of these uh, challenges I mentioned earlier. And regarding the first part of my talk, by essentially drawing these analogies to, to dynamical systems, to control systems, um, we have a, a, both a qualitative and quantitative understanding of how our tuning parameters affects, uh, affect the rates. Um, and this could be use, useful for hyperparameter tuning and could be a first step towards uh, making our algorithms work online and, and uh, doing essentially fast optimization in real time. Yeah. And so with that, I would like to go to the second part of my talk, uh, which is essentially uh, a project by my student, Haoma. And he uses uh, both ideas from machine learning and control theory to, to control um, uh, a robotic arm. Um, so we have this robotic arm here. And uh, the special thing about this robotic arm is that it's driven by pneumatic artificial muscles. Um, so if you load a single muscle with pressurized air, it will, it will contract uh, like this. And uh, of course, if you, if you don't if you have ambient or a little bit more than ambient uh, uh, pressure, then it has this elongated rest position. And you can then put two of these muscles in an agonist antagonist pair um, and, and you can use two of these muscles to drive a joint, um, as, shown, as shown in this figure. And uh, our robot has four degrees of freedom. Um, and each of these degree of freedom is uh, driven by a pair of uh, pneumatic artificial muscles. So uh, here's the different degrees of freedom. And you should now contrast this to the Kubli, right? So the Kubli was a very well engineered um, and, and specifically designed um, control test bed where you know we had these beefy motors at least in in the three three motors case the the, the we had a lot of actuation but but here um, the the difficulty is that these muscles are connected to the joints via this tendon mechanism so it's uh, and this these tendons are also fed through the robot arm and they have quite some friction so so the difficulty in this in this setup is really to um, to, to overcome this friction and to deal with this friction and this messiness of, of this uh, robot arm. And so when, when Hao started, um, he thought, okay, let's, let's start with a classical uh, two degree of freedom uh, control design. So we design a, a linear feed forward controller, a linear feedback controller. And in order to do that, we first need to identify uh, the plant, right? And so you hear that's the inputs, that's normalized pressures to each of the degrees of freedom and outputs uh, theta that's angles, 
So that's the angles of each uh, degree of freedom. And so he did a system identification um, and uh, he did it in a, in a clever way so that you could also characterize the nonlinearity um, of, of the system. And so in, in, re, uh, in, in yellow, you see the level of nonlinearity, uh, the level of noise, and in, in red, you see the level of nonlinearity. So, um, and this is for one degree of freedom, it's uh, essentially a first degree of freedom that, that he characterized here. But of course, he, he did all of them, and there's also a significant coupling uh, between the degrees of freedom. But um, so this, this plot shows you that there's really a substantial amount of nonlinearity. And uh, he then went on to the parametric fit to these data points and uh, uh, applied it and uh, designed a corresponding performance feedback controller. But as you can see, the, the performance is not really uh, satisfactory. So, so we had to really uh, do something about this. And so we went back to, to our uh, two degree of freedom control design. And we thought, okay, um, people in reinforcement learning are currently um, usually optimizing over the feedback controller. Right? But when optimizing over the feedback controller, it can be dangerous because uh, you can suddenly destabilize uh, your system. So we thought, why not just updating uh, the, the feed forward part? And so we decided to use a, a convolutional neural network for the feed forward part. Um, and to compensate for these for the friction and, and the nonlinearity with with this feed forward term, uh, but the question is then how how do we get the data and the labels for training this convolutional neural network, and uh, how applied iterative learning control? So for a fixed reference trajectory, for a fixed uh, angle trajectory of these different degrees of freedom, um, he he then tried to compensate for for the unmodeled uh, nonlinearities. And the way this works is the following, uh, is in the following. So you start with um, an input. So here we're operating in a lifted state space. So this U refers to an entire sequence of inputs over, over a trajectory of a certain length. And we use, uh, I think, two seconds. And so uh, this is a sequence of, of inputs that you apply to the plant. You observe the corresponding sequence of angles and then you, uh, then you estimate uh, model deviations. Um, so um, essentially model deviations with respect to your uh, linear model, the linear model that you identified earlier. Uh, and then once he has uh, these model deviations, he optimizes over the feed forward for the next iteration. And, and here we're interested in tracking error, so we, we minimize tracking error. And the neat thing about this is that it, can, it allows us to include essentially the, the uh, linear model that we identified earlier. And um, here's how this looks like. So for a fixed reference trajectory, even if you start from an initial guess, which is uh, quite off, in about uh, 20 iterations, you obtain uh, tracking performance in the order of a few centimeters. Um, and so that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, but of course, this, this approach here only works for a fixed reference trajectory. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to have this convolutional net network that essentially generalizes for different reference directories. Right? And so how collected uh, apply this iterative learning control to a bunch of different reference directories. And so here's the results um, where you essentially just divide it into a training set and validation set. And he ordered um, the directories in ascending um, a tracking error. So that's the maximum tracking error over the entire directory and just ordered them um, uh, like this. So that's why they have this, you have this funny shape here. And uh, he used that to train, use this data to train his convolutional neural network. And uh, we were pretty happy with the results. So of course, you don't get quite the ILC results because the ILC, of course, exploits that you have this one fixed trajectory, but we were able to generalize quite well uh, from, from across different trajectories. So here's the performance on, on the training set. Um, and you can see the, 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 the level of error is the same in, in the training data as in the validation data. And um, here's how it looks like. So even if we just apply only the feed forward part, it, it works pretty well. But then if you off by a little bit of feedback or even aggressive feedback, it, it, um, we have essentially tracking performance on the error of a few centimeters. Um, and how we then integrate this into a predictive control algorithm. 
because what you wanted to do is to play ping pong with the robot. And uh, so we have a sort of whole uh, control framework where we predict the ball trajectory, uh, predict impacts, and, and then uh, decide on how to return the ball. And then we plan a reference trajectory, minimum jerk trajectory, and then feed this to uh, the tracking controller that I just showed you uh, and complete the return. Um, and so that's how it looks like. And how this very extensive tests here. So he uh, conducted 100 consecutive uh, experiments also with different uh, ball launch positions. And out of these hundreds, uh, we were able to return all, all, of, the, all of the incoming ping pong balls. So, so that, the, the, that was quite satisfactory. Um, and also if you compare it to uh, a sort of black box reinforcement learning approach. So uh, there was earlier work on the same system that used uh, proximal policy optimization. And uh, they required about uh, 10 to 12 hours um, of, of uh, training. Um, and with our approach, even if you count the system identification, which was done in, in a non very efficient way, uh, we're, we're down to uh, two hours on the robot. So that, that leads uh, to a significant improvement in, in the data uh, efficiency. And with that, I would like to conclude and let me highlight here that in the second part of my talk, uh, I, I show you that we can essentially use, we can not only optimize over feedback controllers, but it might be very important to also optimize over feed forward, feed forward controllers. And I show you a way of how to model nonlinear feed forward controllers with convolutional neural networks. And um, because you optimize over feed forward, not over feedback loops, you have, uh, you essentially mitigate the risk of destabilizing uh, the system um, during, during learning. And uh, also um, the method, because it was very structured, uh, you could incorporate some of the prior knowledge um, and, and uh, this leads to uh, a very simple, efficient learning scheme. And with that, I would like to thank uh, essentially my team um, for just the amazing work they're doing. And I would like to thank uh, the Bronco Weiss Fellowship and the Minuto Program for, for, the, um, uh, for, for the support. And I would like to thank you for, for uh, your attention. And here's a graphical summary of, of the talk. Yeah. Thanks. And let me know if you have questions. Sorry, I need to sneeze <laughs> quickly. Okay, thank you, Michael, for the, the main part of the talk. I do see Daniel has a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so Michael, that's a, that was a great, great talk. And it's very impressive, the, the savings in time when okay. you're learning uh, the convolutional neural network. Uh, yeah. just, just to be clear, how do, you, uh, how do you learn this network? What is the input and output? Uh, do I understand correctly that that is essentially inverse dynamics or something else? Yes, yes, these are the inverse dynamics. Exactly, exactly. These are the inverse dynamics. And in principle, you could, you could uh, do this in closed loop, but in our, in our setting, it was actually enough to do this uh, open loop. Um, so for training, you know, we, we did the ILC and we did this ILC in open loop. And then we used the, the resulting uh, data from the ILC as, as our training data for then training the convolutional neural network, right? Because this gives you a map from uh, essentially a uh, reference directory. So theta desired, that's a whole, uh, whole sequence of, of angle trajectories. And it gives you a map from these uh, theta desired to the feed forward that you should apply. Right. And we use that to train the convolutional neural network. Yeah. I see. So the data comes from the ILC output. The data comes from the ILC output, okay. right? Yeah. So you sample uh, a couple of different reference trajectories, you apply ILC, and then you train the convolutional neural network based on that. Yeah. 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 But the, the cool thing is we're, we're currently looking into, because the ILC works so well, um, and, and we, we were thinking now of, of having an online scheme. So how is currently uh, working on an online scheme where it can actually just uh, train this convolutional neural network um, while playing, while playing, uh, while shooting ball to the robots. So essentially getting rid of this uh, convolute of this ILC step. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we're still working on it, but we have uh, first results, which, which look interesting and, and promising. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, you know, if you have other questions. Maybe other, well, maybe other people think about questions. I had one question about the question about the ping pong. Yeah. That is what happens if there's spin on the ball? Uh, yeah, Can yeah. robot that's a good see question. or anticipate that? <laughs> that's a very good question. So we don't model uh, spin actually. Um, and and uh, so, you know, we're just hoping that we're robust enough for uh, the spin. Um, and of course, um, I mean, this, re this works reasonably well. Um, but we're also, uh, yeah, we're, I think you could, you could actually go uh, into details and it would be quite fun. So it's, it's essentially ongoing and, and future work. But the problem with the spin is that uh, we, we have a vision system. So we have a camera system that detects the ball. Um, and unfortunately, this camera system doesn't recognize spin. So the, and you have this ball launcher. And with this ball launcher, you can pre-program a certain spin if you'd like. Um, but but the problem is that you can only reasonably detect the spin after the impact, um, and and that makes it very challenging because once you have the impact, you're already very close to actually intercepting the ball. Um, so so I don't I don't know. So it would be what what would be really nice is to have a, a measurement system um, so so that you could um, observe really the spin during flight. Um, but but I'm not sure if this is feasible. Um, yeah, and and the problem is that the Magnus. So we looked at the Magnus effect, but the Magnus effect is relatively weak, and and uh, it's almost impossible to just determine uh, the spin from the Magnus effect. Uh, the the signal you get is very low. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I, and I think in, in in practice, I mean, Hao told me because he, he's Chinese and uh, he played ping pong for a while. And he told me that uh, actually players, uh, the way they recognize spin is just by looking at the other player. So essentially the way he, he has, he, he does the return, uh, then you can anticipate whether whether the ball has spin or not. So so I don't, yeah, yeah but it's, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, but currently we don't address it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Carl has a question. Just to follow up on the, the spin thing, <clears throat> I guess one could uh, uh, estimate the detractor or the angle of the racket itself uh, to detect the spin, because there's the correlation, right? Yeah, if you have if you have a human player, for example, right? Uh, but maybe let me show you the, the setup we have. So, you know, we have this uh, ball launcher. I mean, to, to kind of create standardized um, standardized uh, returns or, or uh, you know, kind of scenarios. And this ball launcher has, has three wheels and you can, you can set the, the speed of these three wheels and, yeah. and by doing so you can, you can generate spin. And of course, what you're saying is that if you were to play with, with two robots, for example, um, or with a human, then you could, you could try to, to get from the pose of the human, you try to estimate the spin. Yeah. Yeah. I actually played with one of these uh, this weekend, and it was very hard to predict if it's gonna be a spin ball, backspin, or a, or. A... <laughs> okay, are you played with these ball launchers? Or <laughs> uh, my neighbor has one of these in the basement. <laughs> okay, interesting. Okay, okay, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Presumably, if you catch it very quickly after the first bounce. And you have a very stiff racket. Your spin's not going to matter, right? Spin is not. Yeah, if you that's true, that's true. You can you can then, uh, yeah, yeah. But still, I would yeah, of course, yeah. Sort of the position, well, I, the position doesn't doesn't vary greatly. Yeah, yeah. You you still have to change the angle of the paddle according to well, what the spin is, right? If there's a top the, spin, then you need to tilt it. If the if the racket is is very hard, then uh, the the frictional component of the interaction is very small. Particularly uh, if you if you hit the ball if you hit the ball hard, you you can uh, defeat a lot of spin. Yeah, that could be an interesting the, solution. The personal experience is that no, the spin works because when you impact the the, the paddle. Paddles typically have sandpaper on one side and uh, rubber nubble on the other side. 
and it grabs hold. So you get a deflection coming off the paddle first. And the second, you get the uh, not Coriolis, Coriolis effect. Um, starts with the Conata uh, effect of the spinning ball. So the ball itself does not track ballistically as uh, Newton would like it. Rather, it, yeah, it yeah, tracks. The air, I'm sorry? Sure, the aerodynamics are not going to be controlled. But if, if you have a Teflon steel racket, Teflon <laughs> steel racket, Spins. Oh, the that frictional component that's of the spin's not going to do anything. That's that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, the, the interesting thing about, and of course, there's there's various people working on on the robotic table tennis, and so, and I think the interesting part, really, at least for me, about this robot is that it's driven by these pneumatic artificial muscles, and uh, but and of course, you know, I, as you can see in this picture, the the robot is kind of mounted here, and and you know, it cannot move. In, in horizontal direction. So the area in which you can cover is, is kind of limited. Um, and, and, and so for example, we, we tried to play with the, with the robots and uh, you, you can manage to do about uh, two or three back and forth, but then it gets very, very challenging for a human because you have to kind of hit a relatively small area so that the robot can actually reach it. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's there's certainly, you know, the, there's two two questions. One is, you know, is this an interesting test bed for these nomadic artificial muscles, and it, is is an interesting test bed for, for for learning based approaches. And I think I think it is because of these because of this interesting actuation. But but if if we were to just solve the ping pong task, uh, then then I think we'd have to go with a with a different robot design at the first hand, on the first place. Um, but uh, but of course it's it's a it's a very fun and playful uh, experiment. Yeah.